Hi, I'm Ken Tiagi from University of Virginia, and today I'd like to explain um, our recent work on multi-band test of GR using gravitational waves in collaboration with my former students, Doug Carson. Um, to begin, I'd like to introduce um, this plot um, that was pointed up by Alberto Sessana right after the detection of GW1914 that if Lisa was in operation several years before this detection, then Lisa would have seen the signal. Um, the black dashed curve corresponds to the gravitational wave spectrum and uh, for GW1914 and notice that this spectrum lies above the above LIGO noise curve, but also um, Lisa noise curve. Um, and this is called multi-band gravitation wave observation, that you can detect gravitation waves from the same source uh, using different detectors at different frequencies. So I'd like to use this kind of multi-band observations to probe uh, GR, and I'd like to focus on two specific um, theory agnostic tests of GR. One is called parameterized test and the other one is called inframarginal random consistency test. And I will also explain how to apply these model independent tests to specific theories. All right, let me begin by explaining parameterized test. There are several formulations proposed, but the one that I like to introduce today is called parameterized post einsteinian formulation or PPE, formalism for short. And this is a schematic picture showing the gravitational waveform. The one in GR is in red, while the one in certain modified theory of gravity is in blue. And notice that uh, typically if you go away from GR, then there is a shift in the phase. So our task is to be able to capture this phase shift in a generic way without having to specify which theory you want to work on. And uh, the idea, of this PPE formulation is quite simple. Take the GR predicted waveform phase and add one correction term that captures the non GR effect. V here is the relative velocity of two uh, components, while uh, beta is called PP parameter that controls the overall magnitude of the correction term, while the exponent n tells us at which post-instantial order the correction enters. For example, if this n is zero, then it means that the non-GR correction enters at the same order as GR. There's an alternative formulation used by the LIGO Vago Corporation called generalized IMR phenomenon formation, or GIMR for short. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between GIMR and PP formulation in the entire portion, whereas uh, for this GIMR formulation, there's a natural extension to include non GR effects also in the margin random part of the waveform. Now, um, I'm going to show you the bound on PP parent of beta as a function of at which percent on the order the correction enters um, using GW1514 event or um, an event that's equivalent to this one. The green dotted dashed curve corresponds to the upper bound on this part of beta um, using this event uh, using advanced LIGO O1 noise curve. Now imagine that we have cosmic exploring future which detects signal from GW1514 like event, then the upper bound on beta shrinks to this uh, blue one. Even more interesting is that if you have Lisa detecting this kind of event, then the improvement uh, is significant in terms of constraining this data, especially in the lower post Newtonian corrections. Now, if we have both Cosmic Explorer and Lisa in operation, and if we can uh, realize multi-band observation, then the bound on beta improves even further to this magenta curve. This is a log scale, so although it looks like there's not so much difference between say red and magenta one, there is actually up to 50 times improvement in terms of constraining data using multi-band observation compared to LISA alone or Cosmic Explorer alone. All right, then now let me explain how to apply this kind of uh, parameterized test using um, specific theories, and here I'm going to pick one theory called einstein delta gas body gravity motivated by string theory. Uh, Lagrangian density is given in this box where the first term is just a GR einstein hilbert piece, 
In this theory, there's a scalar field called dilaton whose kinetic term is in this last term. And there is a coupling between the scalar field and the metric through this second term. And this RGB squared is that an uh, culture squared combination. And the coupling between scalar field and metric is controlled by the coupling constant alpha. If you set this alpha to zero, then you reduce the GR. Um, in this theory, um, let's see, at four, in, uh, in GR, if you have two black holes orbiting around each other, then there's a gravitational wave emission uh, for its luminosity goes as velocity to the 10th power. Whereas in this theory, there are scalar charges being activated onto black holes, and the scalar charge is proportional to the coupling constant alpha and also inversely proportional to the mass of the black hole. And if such scalar charges are being activated, then they also introduce scalar radiation whose luminosity is given by this form where it depends on the difference in the scalar charges and also uh, velocity to the eighth power. The difference in the velocity dependence comes from the fact that gravitational radiation is quadrupolar while scalar radiation is dipolar. If you take the ratio between these two, then you can roughly derive the fractional correction to the waveform phase, which again uh, is dependent on the difference in the scalar charges and also is proportional to velocity to minus two, which means that this correction enters at minus one p in order relative to gr. Um, from this analysis, we can extract the pp from the beta in terms of this alpha and also the exponent so that we can use the bound on pp for the beta to constrain this theory, um, which I'm going to show you in this plot. And um, here I consider a cosmic explorer and also various space state detectors, including LISA. The current bound in this theory uh, comes from, for example, low mass X-ray binary observations or um, stacking uh, multiple binary platform merger event and uh, the square root of alpha is given by uh, two kilometers at most. Now imagine that in future we have these detectors online and they detect GW50914-like events, then um, you can place bounds up a bound that corresponds to these uh, blue triangles if we just use these detectors alone. Whereas if we can realize multi-band observation between Cosmic Explorer and each of these space-based detectors, for example, LISA here, then you can further constrain the square root of alpha by a factor of two to three. Let me switch the gear to the second model independent test called the inspire major ring down consistency test. The idea here is that you split the waveform into two portions, the inspire and major ring down portion. And then for the inspire portion, you estimate the final mass and spin, assuming GR is correct. Then you do the same for the major ring down part and you check the consistency between the two estimates. Uh, this was done uh, by the LIGO LIGO correlation uh, applied to, for example, the first event. And this plot in the horizontal axis shows the difference in the mass, final mass between the instar estimated and margarine than estimated values. The uh, same for the vertical axis, but now it's the final spin instead of final mass. If GR is correct, then there shouldn't be any difference between inspire estimated value and margarine than estimated value. So the GR point corresponds to the origin. The cyan era ellipse corresponds to the one uh, obtained by the LIGO bug population. So um, this era ellipse contains the origin here, meaning that uh, this event is consistent with GR. Now, imagine that we have Cosmic Explorer in the future, then we should be able to shrink this array ellipse to this tiny uh, red one here. We can zoom into this region. Furthermore, if we have multi-band observation between Cosmic Explorer and LISA, then we can do even better, and the array ellipse now becomes this purple one. So we will have order of magnitude improvement in terms of this kind of test if we have Cosmic Explorer or multi-band detection. Now, uh, just like in the parameterized test case, we uh, 
now interested in how to apply these tests to specific theory. And again, let's take uh, Einstein Toronto gas point as an example where I have already introduced how to obtain the correction in the instar portion of the waveform. Uh, we also introduced correction to the ring down part by taking the QNM frequency and dumping time correction, and we applied this test. Um, if so we are always going to use GR waveform as a template. And if GR is indeed the correct theory of nature, then this error ellipse is what you find in this uh, final mass, final spin difference plane, assuming that uh, future multiband uh, observation between cosmic explorer and LISA detects signal from GW5914 like event. Now, imagine that instead EDGB is the correct theory in reality, but we still use GR as a template waveform. Then, for example, if we inject square root of alpha to be 0.2 kilometers, then the error ellipse now sh shift to this red one, which still contains the GR origin here. But if we further increase the fiducial value of the coupling constant to, let's say, 0.3 kilometers, then now this blue one does not contain the GR point. So now this means that this estimate is inconsistent with the GR prediction. So um, what this is telling us is that if such an observation is realized, then we should be able to place that bound on this coupling constant to be 0.2 kilometers. Comparing this with the current bound of two kilometers, then you can see that there should be an order of magnitude improvement in terms of constraining this theory using this measuring them um, test. There's another application that we considered, which is to probe black hole spacetime. And one way is to use the parameter black hole spacetime. For example, Johans and Baltis proposed this kind of spacetime metric, which looks a bit messy, but um, there's only one arbitrary function h. And if you set h to zero, then you reduce car black hole. Um, you can expand this h about r equals infinity and just consider the leading. Uh, part with some coefficient epsilon 3 that captures the deviation away from car met metric. If you set epsilon 3 to 0, then you reduce to car black hole in GR. Uh, current X-ray observation has placed bound on uh, this epsilon 3 to be 5. Now we took this spacetime metric, we computed correction to the instar portion, ring down portion, and we applied the instar measuring and consistency test, and we found that. Um, with future multi-band observations, we should be able to place bound on this epsilon 3 to be 10 to minus 2, which is 2 to C order of magnitude improvement from the existing bound. All right, let me conclude. Um, I explained two th uh, theory agnostic methods of testing GR using gravitational waves, uh, parameter test, and intermeasuring and consistency test. And um, in both cases, we find a significant improvement in terms of uh, testing GR if we can realize multi-band observations. Um, and um, especially for the inspired measuring and consistency test, we applied this to specific non jar theory for the first time. And in both einstein delton gauss bonnet case and uh, beyond car space time case, we could uh, obtain significant uh, improvement in terms of constraining these theories or this space time compared to the existing bound. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention.